All right, so I like a lot of interaction because that way I know if you know. So <laughs> with that, we're going to be talking, oh, you know what? We're not really talking about pain. As you can see up there, it says pain. <laughs> it's supposed to say brain and gut pain. So whenever we were hooking this up, apparently it didn't do right. But at any rate, my name is Dr. Julie Hayek, and um, I, uh, what do I do? Hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm here and there and everywhere. But at any rate, uh, today we're going to be talking about the gut and the, the, the brain interaction and connection. And for the ones over here that don't have that, you can go ahead and, um, I've got a few ran off there. You can go ahead and take those out. All right, so we're going to first look at the brain. I'm going to share a few little things that you might not have know, known about the brain. Did you know that the brain is so amazing that the information travels 268 miles per hour? That's how fast our brain goes. That's impressive, isn't it? Because even if you drive your car 100 miles an hour, you still not even half the speed as your brain can go, right? And what's happening or taking place is that the neurons, we've got a bunch of neurons, right? Neurons are stimulated and uh, they generate these electric impulses. And that travels from one cell to the, uh, the other cell. So that's what's taking place right up in here. And um, let's just say this is your brain. Does anybody know what this is? This is a huge, well, you know what? Let me just go to the next slide. Let's just talk a little more about the brain because we're going to get into that. So we have uh, 86 billion neurons. So what does that mean? That means that we have virtually unlimited, unlimited storage. So this thing right here is a storage unit. Have you seen one of these before? What are they called? A tetra, tetrabyte? Is that what you call it? Tetrabyte? Okay, it's a terabyte. Okay, so they come in one terabyte, two terabytes, five terabytes. I think this is a two or a three. So think of this as your brain, right? And these right here, these little things here are your USBs, right? These are like, um, you know, 16, 4, uh, 8. I got a whole lot of them, right? This is what I would carry around, my little neurons. I'd be carrying my little neurons around. But now I got one of these, which is my brain, because I got all these inside of here. So now all I need is this one little thing. So my brain has all of this in it, so that means my brain has a whole bunch of neurons that can work. So all I really need is this. Anywhere I go, all I need is this. I don't need to take this whole thing and say, OK, what are we talking about tonight? Oh, yeah, that's on this one. Oh, yeah, let's see. What are we talking about later on? Oh, it's on this one. You see what I mean? The brain has it all. The brain has all of these inside of it. So the neuron. So when we look at the neurons inside of the brain, we see that the connection, which adds one quadrillion which is a thousand trillion. These numbers are huge. That's all inside here, our brain, for these connections. You know, when I was little, you know, fifth grade, fourth, fifth grade, man, I wanted to be a brain surgeon. I thought that would be so cool, right? Being a brain surgeon, figuring out how brains work and all of that, and just exciting about those little neurons and everything. Well, I had a dream. I had a dream, and boy, that dream wasn't so good. My dream was I was a neuron surgeon. I was, I was looking at people's uh, brains, and I was cutting it open and taking the brain out and fixing it up and putting it back in. And in my dream, I couldn't get the brain back in. So I'm like, OK, God, you're probably telling me that's probably not a good thing to do. So don't even pursue that. 
because now you put that in your head, that image from that dream in your head. So when you actually do that, you're probably like, oh no, maybe I shouldn't do any surgeries. Uh, maybe I'll just learn a little more about the brain and tell people about the brain instead of actually going in there and you know, doing all those little things. So I decided to do other things instead of that. Uh, still become a doctor and be very, very uh, into different areas of being a doctor, you know. I, I thought about psychology and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I read stuff where you probably shouldn't really be a psychologist because everybody's always, you know, you're always, oh, oh, you're listening to people and you're like, oh, they got this problem. <laughs> oh, that person got that problem. I don't want to fill my brain with that. Okay, I want to fill my brain with good stuff. I want to make sure that I'm, 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 I'm focusing on the good and not the bad. That's why when people would come into my office in, in uh, Detroit area, I used to have an office in Detroit, they would come in and they have all these health issues. And so we would be talking and stuff and I'd be listening, I'd be praying with them. And then after we got done, um, I don't do like most people, I just get my book out, my notebook, and I just get a sheet of paper out. So I got one sheet of paper and I'm like, okay, this is what you can do. Didn't say anything what you cannot do. So this is what you can do. So I started writing down all those things that they can do. I've had people so surprised, like, I could eat all that? I can actually do that? And I'd be like, yes, you can do this. You can do this. It's, it's not like, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. It's like when I first became a vegetarian. My mother cried. She said, oh, no, you're going to wither and fly away. I'm like, Mom, no, 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 no. You see that big garden we got out? Our garden at home was a little bigger than this chapel. It was probably maybe twice this size going that way, this way, and that way. So we had a huge garden at home. And so I would tell my mother, I can eat everything in that garden. It's just I don't eat the pigs, and I don't eat the chickens, and I don't eat the cows, and I don't drink the milk, and I don't do the cheese, but I can eat all of that. So my mother got a little happy about that. And so there are things you can do. So you just focus on the good things, the positive things, instead of the negative things, because that's what we are drawn to is the negative. Right away, immediately, oh, they're talking bad, or oh no, this is oh, and you get that stuck in your head. It's called an image in your head. And so you don't want to focus on those things. Just remember you have 86 billion neurons, maybe even 100,000, but we have a lot of them, and they are working. So did you know that uh, the spinal cord stops growing at the age of four? At the age of four! Your spinal cord is done growing. Yeah, you're trying to wonder, is that really true? Can that really be possible? I know, that's kind of weird, right? But that's a, I want to share some facts with you because these are things that you probably don't even know. And you know, the, you know, you know how much of your mind do you actually use? What, what's the big saying that people always say? How much? 10%. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to shatter that today because it's not 10%. You actually use your whole brain. You really do. You see, with all the scientific stuff and research that we have today, when you're using your brain, right, when I use this and I'm taking something out of this, which is part of that in there, it's that part that lights up. So when they're looking at your brain and they're looking at what's taking place at that period of time, they see that part lit up. And they see that part lit up. Right now, a whole bunch of parts are lit up because I'm speaking, I'm thinking, I'm talking, I'm moving. So all of those areas are going to be lit up in my brain because I'm doing a number of things at once. You see, if you're focused on one task, that part of your brain is going to be lit up, whatever that is, if you're just doing that one task. You know, so you're focused on picking it up, putting it down, picking it up, putting it down. Same thing with exercise. You're just focusing on that one thing. But a lot of times we don't even have to focus on things. If you're walking, you're thinking about right, left, right, left, right. No, you're not thinking about, you know, maybe sometimes your arms. Sometimes you have to start saying, oh, I got to move my arms, you know. Or you just have to pick up the speed because if you pick up the speed, automatically you're going to be doing this thing with your hands, right? I know one thing that Dr. Agatha always said. She said when you want to walk and you want to get a full body workout, all you need to do is take a towel, right, like a, 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 a hand towel. You put hand, your hand on one side of it and on the other side of it. So then that way it reminds you, a cue in your, in your brain, that you need to be moving your arms. And then if you get hot and sweaty, you just take the towel and you dry up, right? And you just keep on going. Otherwise, if you have a buddy, right, that you walk with, you kind of slow down and you talk a little bit but you're not really getting all that real 
heavy duty exercise in unless you're, ah, you know, and you're, and you're like, every so often you're talking because you're, ah, okay, you know? And that's what you need to be doing. A little bit of both, right? As we walk with God, we talk with God. So sometimes we need to go fast and sometimes we need to go slow. All right, so how much does our brain weigh? Three pounds. What a baby thing. A little thing, our brain. But you know what? If you, if, you, if you have someone laying down and you're holding their head, it's heavy. It's probably about 10 pounds, maybe 13. Because you got the skeleton part of it. You got your head, the bone here plus, right? And then the skin and everything else. So that all adds on to that. Three pounds of power right here. Remember that. We have three pounds of power right here. We have 86 billion neurons. That's amazing. This morning, what was the big thing that he said this morning? He said something about <clears throat> the last thing he said. Do you remember what it was? Uh, this morning for our morning worship or devotional. Oh my goodness. We all have a brain problem. You wasn't here? Ooh, she missed it. Well, it was about how powerful we really are when God created us. We have so much available to us, right? And it was something to do. I can't remember exactly what was said or, or how it was stated, but it was about um, to go about rejoicing and, and not to get down and out and start talking about faith because you don't have faith now because you're talking about the negative thing instead of talking like, yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can, whatever, right? But it was more about having that faith and knowing that it is possible. Having that, you put it on that faith. You remember the words? Does anybody remember the words that was spoken? There it is. Talk and act as if you have faith. Invincible faith. Invincible faith. That was the word I was looking for. Invincible faith. Talk and act as you have an invincible faith. So next time you feel a little down and out, remember some of these facts about the brain. Because our brain is amazing. It is so amazing. I get excited every time I think about the brain because I love the brain. Whoops. One more thing about the brain. See the light bulb? Did you know that our brain can generate 23 watts of power? <laughs> our brain generates 23 watts of power. And that's enough to light up a light bulb. Now you probably wonder why they always put a little light bulb up here, like in those little drawings, a little light bulb, like, oh, I got an idea. <laughs> because they know that our brain is so powerful that it has these little, these little neurons that are giving these little impulses and it's going and it's just like all that energy is like boom, you know? Right now you have a little uh, idea, a little light bulb going on in every one of your heads. I can see it on your faces. You're like, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. So let's get, a, let's get into some negative stuff. Okay, sleep. Oh yeah, that was the very first class, right? Monday morning, the very first class, what did they talk about? No, they didn't. It was natural remedies. <laughs> but there was a class on sleep, wasn't there? Maybe it was yesterday morning. Tuesday morning. That was last, yesterday. So they talked about sleep, right? So when you are not getting enough sleep, what happens? Well, when we're talking about the brain, because you, you heard about the other stuff, you heard maybe a little bit, I think he did talk about that. There's a protein buildup that goes on in the brain and it's linked to Alzheimer's disease. So when we're not getting enough sleep and you do this over and over and over again, guess what? You might just say, hello, Alzheimer's. Yes, I'm welcoming you in. Well, no, you don't want that. Alzheimer's is not something you want, right? I'm sure everybody knows somebody or have heard about Alzheimer's disease. Not a good thing. So when it comes to the brain, the brain needs us to slow down and sleep. That's why we go through different sleep cycles. So then that way it kind of helps wind down the brain because the brain is always working and the heart's always working, right? Those are the two things that are happening all the time. 
But if we eat late at night, what else is working? Our gut. So the brain, here's another good fun fact. The brain tissue is the size of a little grain of sand. That's tiny. That's so small. And guess what? There, it contains 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. That's incredible when you think about all of that taking place in a small area, right? This, to me, is pretty big because I prefer something that's smaller like this, don't you? This is, this is, but when you think about it, I remember in the 80s when they used to have computers and I went to a computer camp. Yeah, in the 80s, I went to a computer camp. And uh, I didn't even know why they chose me from school to go to that computer camp, but it was fun. I learned a lot of stuff. And uh, when you saw computers back then, it's like, it like filled up a whole room. And it was just like, that's a lot of room for that computer. And to figure out, and, and, and the programming of the computer stuff was way different. Like now it's like, phew, it's pretty easy to put stuff together. It just takes a little time to fine tune it. But uh, things change. And so we're seeing more and more because things have changed when it comes to our brain and what they uh, uh, are finding out. The other thing is stroke, stroke, what happens to the brain when a person gets a stroke is that these neurons get damaged. So if these neurons get damaged, and how do they get damaged? It's because there's no oxygen. There's no flow of blood, no, no blood flow, no oxygen going into the area. So it damages the brain, and that's considered a stroke. My dad had a massive stroke. And let me tell you, you want to know about hydrotherapy and fomentations? My dad could walk after three months. He went from, he went from our Cresco Hospital, then he went to our uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and then he went to where his doctor was at in Decorah. So after the third hospital, and about three months later, my dad still is not able to walk. And with this stroke, this massive stroke, not only could he move his whole right side, but he could only see like this, like you guys over there, I don't even see you. I remember once when I came into the room, and I was standing right there, and my siblings are asking, do you see Julie? My dad's like, no, I don't, no. He couldn't really talk that much either, but he's like, no, like he didn't know. You know, but if you think about it, if you put your hands like this, you're very limited when you're, when you're looking. So in a stroke situation, what happens is there's blood flow that stops and that damages the cells in your brain because they're not getting what they need in order to live. You've heard the saying where you can only eat or you don't have to eat for so many days and you'll die or, well, they don't put it like that, but you, can, you, you have to drink water. If you don't drink water in so many days, you'll die. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, so we're, we're, we're looking at this process taking place, but it doesn't take very long. If you have no oxygen or blood flow to your brain, it doesn't take very long for those cells to get damaged. So Parkinson's, the brain, the same thing is going on in the brain because those cells are starting to die. So Parkinson's is somewhat similar to a stroke, but just a little bit different because a stroke is something more sudden, right? Whereas a Parkinson's is a slow, slow. So let's talk a little bit about brain issues. I have up here anxiety, depression, Dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and brain fog. How many of you have ever experienced brain fog? Yeah, right? What was that from? Not, not enough sleep? <laughs> or you were just doing too much work? Maybe not enough water? Right? So what about anxiety? You know, a lot of people have anxiety, especially I'm seeing so many people because I'm the, I'm the doctor on staff over at Country Life. So there I see a lot of people. We have about five or more people every day that come in brand new. And uh, then once they come in, they tell other people and other people come in and they're bringing their friends because they know that there's something about country life. It's like, it's like a light. You know that little light we saw? It's like the brain of the place where people know that if they go there, they can get some help. And so um, it's like a lighthouse in the city of Columbus, right? And uh, if anybody knows anything about someone got 
help there, they're always telling their friends. And, and some people, they're just looking for a place to eat because they're vegetarian, vegan, right? And so they want to come. And then they find out other things and different things that we have there. So anxiety and depression are two huge things that I saw in 2020. 2020 and even this year, I'm seeing a number of people coming in with anxiety and depression because the state of the mind, and I believe that mental health is probably one of the biggest issues that we have in the world today. I know in Detroit there was a big thing, mental issues or mental health. And so with that, I see that there's even more when it comes to mental health because of COVID came in, coming to town. With COVID, what happened to the people? They watched so much TV, they got scared to go anywhere, except for get that toilet paper, and what else were they buying? And paper towels. I mean, really? When, when I was getting low, I'm like, oh my goodness, where am I going to find mine? Right? And you're like, when are you guys going to have some more in? Oh, we don't know. We're, we ordered it. Okay. But that's the thing, right? Paper towel and, and toilet paper, they were probably reading the news or on the computer somewhere, and those are the things that you need to get. I would think first water and food. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can always go outside and get some grass if you need to wipe, right? You don't want to do that. But you can always take other things to use. However, here's the thing. Anxiety and depression are huge. Dementia, that's just something even bigger. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is part of... Uh, a part of that. So let's go through that. Anxiety is simply this, and it's an emotion characterized, you don't have that in your thing, sorry. I just decided to add that in there. So instead of just reading stuff, this way you can read with me. So anxiety is an emotion characterized by an unpleasant state of inner turmoil. Has anybody had any internal turmoil happen? You might start having a little anxiety attack because of that. I know people that have anxiety attacks. Often accompanied, now this is often accompanied, that internal turmoil is accompanied a lot of times by a nervous behavior such as pacing back and forth or, you know, a little rocking motion or whatever. They're, they're just, they can't stand still. Like they, they just got to keep moving, right? So um, it could be that or it's an unpleasant feelings of dread over anticipation, anticipating certain events. Like you're thinking the worst. Oh, so-and-so wants to see me. Oh, that's the boss. Oh, man, now what does he want, you know? Instead of thinking the positive, why do we think of the negative? It's like when I used to teach at the university, I would tell the students, I'd say, I, I let them know way up at front. I'd say, look, if I ever want to talk to you one-on-one -on -one when it comes time to break, it's probably a good thing. More than, more than likely, it's going to be a good thing, okay? Because I've had students where I'm like, they're so bright, they're so smart, but what happened this week? Their stuff just wasn't right on. So I'd be like, oh, um, I remember Ruth's name. <laughs> Ruth, would it be all right during break just to come and stay, stay behind and talk to you? This gave me an opportunity to get a one-on-one -on -one with the student and let them know, you know, I, I think there's something going on. You need to let me know, you know? Let me know if there's something going on so that way I can help you. Maybe I can help you. And then I would pray with them. Uh-oh, I hope the university isn't listening. <laughs> But um, I, would, I, would, I would ask them, are you a Christian? Would it be all right to pray? And they would say yes. So I would pray for them. And a lot of times these students would just start crying. And let me tell you what that crying does. It releases the stress that's built up because they got so much going on with their home life, with their children, their spouse, their work, and now they got school too on top of it. Yeah, not so good. But when someone comes along like me that's willing to say, hey, can I help you? Is there something I can do? Let me in, you know? Let me in, let me see if I can help you. And when we do that, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. Um, so we do a lot of overreacting to a situation that, that we don't even really need to do. But that's part of anxiety. It gets, it gets the best part of us and it makes us, or puts us into that state. So depression, what is depression? It's a mental condition characterized by feelings, here we're hearing feelings again, of severe despondency and dejection. So what does that really mean? It's basically talking about your feelings of inadequacy and guilt, or often accompanied by a lack of energy, you just don't have the, 
You just like you don't even want to do anything. You get into that format of like, I'm so depressed, okay, whatever. And you're like, you're like dragging your feet, so to speak. And uh, you're not really interested in anything. Now, if you've had any death that has been close to you, you almost feel like your life is like gone. If you had anybody really close to you that was like your support or whatever, and that person has died, let me tell you, I know what that feels like. I had a mother that died, I had a father that died, I had a brother that died, I had another brother that died, I had another brother that died, I had a sister that died, and I had my bestest, bestest friend ever die. When I say bestest, bestest, I mean she was my support. We talked on the phone every day about seven times. Because I lived by myself, I had no friends, I moved into Detroit area, I didn't really know anybody but the people that I worked for, right? And people at work were not my friends, they were my acquaintances, right? That's how I look at it. And so my best friend was three hours away. <laughs> and she said, look, you don't have family there, you don't have nobody there, I'm gonna keep up with you. And I said, okay, sounds good. So we would talk. We, we, she was my prayer partner. Every morning at five o'clock, we'd have morning prayer. Seven o'clock, right before she leaving out for work, she would, she would be on there, she would call me up on her way to work and we'd have a nice 20 minute talk. And then after work, about four o'clock, she'd call me again. And then if she needed anything about five, six o'clock, she'd call me or I'd call her because she usually runs stores because she likes to get that little energized through walking after work so she can whew, release everything from work and get that out from walking. And so we don't want to have depression, but sometimes that sets in. Didn't we hear about somebody that had depression? If you've read your Bible, you can name off a few people. One of the ones that, I, that comes to mind is the guy that, 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 that was swallowed up by that big fish. You know, he was running away from God. God, I don't want to do that. I really don't want to do that, God, because I know you're so, God, you're so good, you're so kind. I don't want to go there and tell those people. Right? He was running away from God. He actually got on the ship that was going the opposite direction. And then he made all the guys on the ship a little uneasy, like, hello, it's a storm now, and there must be somebody that is religious on this ship, and you need to repent or whatever. You need to pray or something. And, they, and what did he say? Just throw me overboard. Because he come to the part of depression where he didn't want to live no more. And that wasn't the, first, that wasn't the only time either. <laughs> he did that. They threw him off, and God saved him because God said, Jonah, I chose you. When God chooses you to do something, just say, okay, God, I don't really want to do it, but I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't want to go there. I could tell you something, but I'm not going to. I really don't want to go there. I'm not ready for there. I'm not ready for that yet, God. And God is saying, look, I'm trying to save you. He's trying to save us. So just say, okay, God, I don't want to go there, but I'm going to go there because you want me to go there, and I'm not going to be like a little kid pouting. Because that's not a good witness. Just say, okay, God, I don't want to go there. Just let me get it out. Do whatever I got to do. Get it out. And I'm on my way. I'm sent by God. And that's exactly what happened to him. Once he got that three days out, and that's probably why we do a three-day fast here, you know? Right? We put him on water for three days. <laughs> get all that out, that negative stuff out. So now we can put in all that good stuff, that good food, that good stuff, right? That good energy. And when he got out, he started preaching, right? And they took the warning, and they were all saved. There was about 100,000 of them saved. He was the great, greatest evangelist of all time at that time, right? A whole city of 100,000 people. And then what happened? He got depressed again. Are you kidding me? I would have been on another high. Like, what? I like going on adventures with Jesus, okay? When he calls me to go, I'm like, okay, I really don't want to go, but... Okay, I'm going to trust you. Put on my seatbelt and off we go. And it's just like, wow. When you get done with that, you are on a high. I don't see why he wasn't on a high from that. I guess because he knew that God was just going to save him anyway. But they did something. They repented. And that's why they were saved. So if they would have never repented, they would have never been saved. Okay, so dementia. What is dementia? It's a broad category of brain diseases that cause a long term, often gradual decrease of our, of our brain, right? And the ability to think and remember as well as severe enough to affect daily functioning. 
So Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is a part of this dementia. So if you get one of those, what's taking place is that over a period of time that it will start affecting you in such a way that um, once you get dementia, you don't even know who's who. You don't even really know what's going on. And what's the worst part is you need someone to put on your shoes and dress you too. And then to make your food, it's just like you're just there. It's a sad condition. Um, but there's a lot of different things, right? There's a lot of different things with that. So that's why it's important to know about brain health. So Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are part of that. So Alzheimer's is a chronic neuro neurodegenerative disease that usually degenerates over a time with memory loss. So what's taking place here is that it's progressing that process over a period of time of mental deterioration that can lead to dementia. I've worked with people that has Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and I can report that it can be reversed. Amazing, right? I actually had a guy that came in with Parkinson's here in Colum Columbus, put him on a program for 90 days, and uh, the thing about it is, if they follow the program, that's gonna be a good thing. But if you don't follow the program, then it's pretty hard. And one thing I like about here at EG Pines, when people come here for those 17 days, it's a controlled environment, right? And so we're doing everything we possibly can to reset stuff so then that way you can get the, the results. But now working at Country Life, people don't live there, okay? It's a place where people come and go. So you have, to, you have to really be working with people, following them through, making sure that they got things set up at home, make sure that they got the support that they need, as well as providing them with the things that they need in order to be successful. But it is possible. So Parkinson's is a long-term degenerative disorder of the CNS, which is the central nervous system. That's our brain and our spinal cord and it mainly affects the motor system. So your, the motor system is your movement, right? And the symptoms emerge slowly over a period of time and it gets worse as time goes by. So the non-motor symptoms become more and more common. Early symptoms are when you have a tremor, a rigidity, or slowness in movement, right? And difficulty with walking. So those are signs, right? Hmm. Cognitive and behavioral problems may occur with depression and anxiety. So even those two, if it's not handled or not, you're not getting a grip on those things, that can also go into these other things as well. Um, dementia is a common and later stages of this disease. So with all of these that we talked about, those could be your first signs of going into something even worse. So let's look at the five triggers for brain disease. First, we have stress and anxiety, brain's fight or flight response. We heard about that on Monday, the first thing that was talked about with Dr. Mark. He talked about the, the flight or fight, uh, talking about our hormones and how they have a huge role to play. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, and whatnot, these are triggers uh, for us to understand when it comes to brain disease. Inflammation is one of the other things I love to talk about. Inflammation of the brain and body. Inflammation, is, it can be painful, it can be stiff. And so it's huge. I think that most people have inflammation before uh, they actually start getting the, 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 the problems that take effect. However, inflammation to me is probably the number one cause for any type of disease actually. When you're diabetic, you have inflammation. When you, have a, when you have heart issues, you have inflammation. You see what I'm saying? So inflammation is very huge. When it comes to diet, we need to understand what type of foods actually sabotage your brain. There are foods that affect your brain, and we're gonna be talking about that. Uh, toxic environment, how heavy metals and pesticides and GMOs also affect your brain. So these are very important things that we need to look at. So these are five triggers, and we're gonna go through some of these to look at it. So now I'm gonna just have a little interaction. I need two people, can two people just raise their hand quickly and ask, and the question is, 
Can you share at least one thing that you learned? I have someone way back there. Yes, can you share? Okay, so she said that she learned about the myth, not realizing that 10% of the brain, because that's what we all have learned, that 10% is what we use of our brain. Maybe we only use 10% each time we do something, unless we're doing a lot of activity at one time. But yes, so you learned that, and um, I didn't get the other. Um, but I do have something for you. This is a very good thing to do. Um, Sudoku, this is a very good thing for your brain, for your mind. Can you run that back to her, please? Thank you. Okay, anybody else? I can give you something, little something, little, oh, look at this. They love this. Um, we're going to have more of this. <laughs> I do have some ginger tea. So who would like to share for the ginger? Okay. Um, okay, what, what, what did you learn about the brain that, that you were like, that was kind of cool? The spinal cord stops growing at the age of four. Yes, that's another good one. I can move over here, sorry. I can't. I don't uh, Yes. Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation. Yeah, which, which causes us to have Alzheimer's. Yeah, amazing, right? Sorry, I move around a lot. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so now let's go on to the next part. Let's talk about the gut and the brain, right? As we know, the gut is very important. People don't realize this, but it really is. And we have someone way back a long time ago that said something about the gut. We know that the brain is so important as well. I mean, the brain is so key to a lot of things. And uh, the way these two work together is amazing. So the gut, what is the gut? What is the gut? What do you think of when you hear the word gut? Our digestive system. What's another thing? Anything? Stomach. Intestines. Right, all of that. Our gut. Now, now, do you think that a lot of people have gut issues? Oh, my word. Working at Country Life, it seems like every day someone got a gut issue, if not more than one. They're coming in with these kind of things. But let me tell you, it's not always the same thing I'm going to give them for the, for the protocol. Yeah, sure. What's the first thing people think of? Okay, you uh, uh, are, are experts over here. When someone has a gut issue, what's the first thing you're going to give them? At least name one herb. Everybody knows it. Come on. What is it? Probiotic. A probiotic. Okay. That's not quite an herb, but... <laughs> okay, so, so this is good. This is good. So, so when people think of the gut and a gut issue, people think of probiotics. People think of... If you're herb, I'm, I have a master herb, I'm a master herbalist, so what do I think of? Slippery elm, aloe vera. Those are the two big things that come to my mind when I'm working with people. And of course, probiotics, prebiotics, I think of that too, depending on if they've taken a lot of antibiotics. So if someone has taken a lot of antibiotics, and I take that into consideration what's going on, because I need to know about the person. I don't have a sheet of paper that they bring in and say, here's all my history. You know, they don't bring that into me. They just come and say, I, I have this problem. I have pain here or here, or wherever it is. And they just tell me their problem. And so I listen to them and I say, okay. And in my mind, I'm like, I got to go talk to my boss. Okay. Um, so I say to them, I say, okay, okay, that's okay. So let's pray. Is it all right if I pray? Let me pray for you. Okay. So I am praying for them. I am, I am, I'm like claiming promise for their healing. Right. And then I'm having this conversation with God as I'm praying, right? I'm saying, God, because he's my boss. I'm like, God, what, my protocol for this person is thus and thus. What do you think? I mean, I don't know all the other things that are going on in their life, but you do. So you tell me what I need to tell them. What do I need to do for them? And when we're all done, I'm like, God, is that it? That's all? Or, oh, man, all of those things? And so then when I get done praying for them and claiming the promises and everything, I ask them a few questions because in my mind I'm like, that is nothing that I would have gave them. No. But you see, I have to be obedient when I hear God talking to me as I'm having that conversation with him. And he says, no, 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 give them this and this. 
And I'm like, that is not even part of the protocol for that. So then I ask them a few questions because I know what that's for. And sure enough, it's something else. It's a bigger issue that needs to be solved. And once that big issue is solved, then that will be solved. I mean, it's amazing. But when we have certain situations that go on, just by having some an anxiety attack, your stomach's gonna st probably start hurting. So what we gotta do is we gotta figure out well, 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 what is truly the cause. We're not gonna be chasing after every symptom because that's what most people do. You chase after the symptom. You chase after the symptom, and what are you really doing? You're putting out little tiny fires. No, 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 no. When you come, we're looking at the whole person. So I gotta know a little more. You gotta ask a little, you gotta ask a few questions. But you know, hypocrisy, he said, all, how much? All disease, it begins in the gut. Huh, interesting, isn't it? He observed that all disease starts right here. When I was taking classes, uh, natural, I don't know, naturopathic medicine, uh, when we were taking classes um, and we were talking about different issues of the stomach and stuff and how that is where our feelings are. Right here is our feelings. If you've ever been pregnant as a woman, uh, not the guys, but if you've been pregnant and you're out here like this and you're walking around, right, what happens? Most people want to do what? They want to touch your stomach. Just this last weekend, someone came to church and she had a nice big belly and the one lady that I was talking to, next thing I know, she turns over to that lady and she goes, I want to touch your stomach. And she's like, like this close. No, the lady said, no, don't touch me. I don't like people touching me, especially there. Well, we need to respect each other. But the stomach holds a lot of emotion. Now, if that lady would have actually touched her stomach, I don't know what would have happened. Probably would not have been a good thing. Because usually people just, I don't know what it is. Why is it that we want to just touch people's stomachs? No idea. Feel the kick. Feel the kick. Well, I don't know if they're going to feel it, but, <laughs> but at any rate, the gut holds our feelings. The gut holds those things here. Right? So let's talk a little bit about the gut. So connected physically by millions of nerves, our gut. And mainly it's that vagus nerve right here in the brain, right? The vagus nerve and the nervous system because that's where they kind of electrify. They, they're working up and down that area. And 500 million, 500 million neurons are where? Right here in the stomach. 500 million neurons. We had about, what, 86 billion in your brain? No, we have 100 billion in your brain. Just trying to test you. I put it on there. So 500 million neurons are found in your stomach, and 100 billion are in your brain. That's just simply amazing. We got a lot of stuff going on in, the, in, 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 our, in, our, in our gut, in our stomach area. Now, this is just to let you know that we have these things called transmitters. They're, they're neurotransmitters. That's part of our neurons. And they are transmitting certain chemicals or proteins and stuff throughout our body. So they have to be connected. And if they're not connected, if you have a faulty wire, what happens? The machine or whatever doesn't go right. Or if you have like a light bulb or something in your, and there's something wrong with the connection, it doesn't work right. I know a lot of times with computers, when you fold up your thing, uh, when you put it into the power source, right, and it's got a problem there, it's not because that connection, that wire is not doing well because once you bend it just the right way, now it's not touching. But once you keep it up like that, it touches so that way the current for the power can get into your computer. I've had a computer where the thing here, the joint, was not very good. And so these chemical structures of these neurotransmitters, what they do is they have these connections between the brain and the stomach. Now, some of the things I want you to pay close attention to is your serotonin. Serotonin. Do we hear that before, maybe? What is serotonin? Well, what kind of things, why would, what, what, what makes you think of serotonin? 
Yeah, what was that? S L E sleep. Yes. Serotonin. When you think of sleeping properly and stuff like that, right? Serotonin, melatonin, the the the, the part of those things uh, operating and doing their thing. Endorphins. You know, the, so there's a number of different things there. These tra these um, these neurotransmitters. So in the gut, we have these neurotransmitters which produce in the brain, control the feelings and the emotions. Your serotonin makes you happy. Your endorphins make you happy. And then also that clock that you need, serotonin, melatonin. Uh, making sure that we're, we're, we have times when we go to sleep, times that we get up. When we're on a schedule, let me tell you, you're running really good when you have a schedule. And so that's a very important thing. Uh, neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters produced in the gut cells, trillion microbes like serotonin produced there as well. We have GABA, which is gamma amino bitric acid, which also works with fear and anxiety. So if our body is not making this, then that means that we're going to be having some problems, the gut as well as the brain. So this is what it looks like if you were to go to the store. We have some there, GABA, G-A-B-A. Now, in 2015, there was a study that showed that it helps enhance your thinking as well as task performance. So it's a really good thing for your brain. Not only that, but in 2012, there was a study that said if you take 100 milligrams daily, it reduces medical, or mental, mental stress, mental stress. Also, in 2019, they did a study about workout recovery and muscle building. I believe he talked a little bit about that when he was talking about the sleep thing, but he didn't talk about the GABA, I don't think. But he was talking about that study with that, um, like with rest and stuff and all of that. If we use this, they also did a study, in that study they were showing that if you use it with wheat protein, whey protein, it increases the levels of the growth hormone. Remember hearing that one, the growth hormone? Growth hormone is something that people would take once they get about 40, 45. Now, why is that? Because around 30 to 40 years of age, you start losing the growth hormone in your body. You don't have as much. And why is that so important? Because when you're young, you got it. But as you, as you get older, it's less and less. So that means you start aging. So the aging process starts kicking in about 30, 35, 40. And that growth hormone is starting to lower. And so with GABA, if you take GABA, that will help with that. People are all into staying young. Now, when you see this picture right now, what do you think of? What is it? Look at one slide and then look at the other. Food? Your gut. Now, someone in the back had said something when I said something about the gut. What is the thing that you would take if you have gut issues? Remember what they said back there? Probiotic, right? So we need probiotics. And there's foods you can take that act like probiotics. Because we have prebiotics and probiotics. You've heard of prebiotics? Prebiotics are those foods that you take to feed the probiotics, which is your good bacteria in your stomach. So probiotics, they increase the GABA, right? And that will reduce the anxiety and the depression-like behavior. So if we're eating good foods, that automatically is going to be a good thing. So we just got to know what kind of foods are we supposed to be eating that's going to help us. Foods that promote probiotics, good bacteria in the gut. Um, so this picture here is basically showing you what a healthy CNN, which is your central nervous system, and a diseased um, central nervous system looks like. On the top part, you will see the brain one that's healthy and one that's not. And then you'll see the gut. And in those little circles on each side, you will see one that is healthy and one that is not. And the one that we're looking at here is leaky gut syndrome. It's a big issue. A lot of people have this. And so with the healthy one, we see that you have good behavior, your mood, you don't have a big mood swing or anything like that. Um, your, your thinking is good. Um, your physiological, uh, 
clearance of proteins. Okay, so what's happening here is in the brain, it's getting rid of those proteins that are building up. Right, because we talked about the brain diseases, right? So what happens if they're, if they're not cleared out, then that's gonna create a problem. But when you're healthy, it's doing its normal thing. It's, everything's moving the way it's supposed to be moving. There's a lot of flow going in and out. We, and, I, and I believe Eric talked about your lymphatic system a little bit. Well, the best way to understand the lymphatic system is that where there's a blood vessel, you also have a lymphatic vessel, okay? So I tell people that the lymphatic system is your garbage highway. And there's certain areas where they are garbage spots in our system. So what happens is when the blood is purifying itself out, it has these little roads that go into the lymphatic system, which is the highway that goes and takes the garbage to those dump sites. Wherever it's closest, it goes to those dump sites. So if you think about waste management, inside your house, what do you have? You got trash. So every week you take the trash out to where they're gonna pick it up. So then the waste management people come in, or the garbage man comes and he puts it in the truck. So the time that you're taking your trash out of your house, it's like your house is your white blood, your, your, it's actually your, your blood vessel. And so you're taking that trash because the blood vessels are clearing out the bad stuff and as you're walking to put it on the, wherever it is, the road or wherever you put your garbage, now that's like transporting the garbage out of the vessel and you're now putting it here. So then that way when the garbage man comes in the lymphatic part, they're coming and they're picking it up and they're taking it to the dump site. So what happens in a damaged or leaky gut, what takes place is now you have stuff that's not getting taken out this is a huge problem because especially in the brain, if those cells are dying and it's not getting properly taken out, what does is, what is your garbage smell like after a couple weeks if you don't take it out? Maybe you don't know because um, you've always taken it out. But if you put something in the garbage or someone put something in your garbage and you didn't realize and now, huh, you're like, why is that stinking up in there? It's because they threw something there that you usually take out to your, to your garden, right? And so now you have an issue and you gotta get it out. So what's happening to the brain is when this takes place and it's not being cleansed out, these cells are dying. And when those cells in the brain die because of that or that protein overload in there, that buildup, that clogs up your brain. So you start getting some of these diseases that we talked about of the brain. So it's very vital that we're eating certain things, so it's making sure that this is uh, equal out to take care of that food, to make sure it digests properly, and not to be out of whack, because when we take a lot of antibiotics, what takes place is now we have more of the bad stuff, the bad uh, G, um, microbi the microbiomes in there, in your gut, and you have less of the good. So now they're overdoing that, and then you get leaky gut or another gut issue, and then that signals up to the brain, and now we have a lot of pollution going on outside of the gut, all right? So um, another thing is if you're looking at the brain, we have the normal brain and we have the Alzheimer's brain. You can see clearly the difference between the two. One is just perfectly the way it's supposed to be with a lot of white matter in there, looks great. But on the other side with the Alzheimer's one, it's kind of scattered, kind of weird, right? And it's not full, it's not plump, it's not looking as well. And then we got these ventricles in there and that white matter area that's bringing on this buildup. So that's a big, huge problem. So when we're looking at neurodegenerative diseases, what we're seeing is that the, the folding of that native folding, okay, it's not quite the way it should be, and then that, because it goes into that misfolding, and then we have the inclusion of that formation inside the cell there, and then you see that it dies. So what needs to happen is um, autophagy, autophagy. What that is is where they, it's like Pac-Man, right? So what you're doing is, is it coming through and it's eating up those cells. 
So if that process is not taking place of eating those up, it stays. So visualize this. You have a basket of apples, but in the middle, you have one that's rotten. And you don't notice it because it's in the middle. Over a period of time, you start saying, hmm, what's wrong? It smells a little bit, but I don't see anything. But if you don't go in there, you're not going to spot it to take it out. So that's the process that's taking place in the brain. That if it's not taken care of, and it's just, you know, you just keep doing your same old thing over and over, and that's it. Now we have a problem because the problem is you have to remove that rotten apple so it doesn't affect the rest of the apples. If we don't do that, this is what's happening in the brain, if those are not, if those cells that die in the brain are not taken out of the brain, what's happening is it stays there and it starts affecting the other brain cells and they start dying. Now we have dementia over a period of time because it was not dealt with. So we have to find things that we can do in order to take care of that. So can I have get a couple people just to say one thing about your gut? What did you learn about the gut? What's that? You don't want it to be you. No, 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 no. I said what I learned about me, just listening to it. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's real. Mm -hmm. Brain system. Yeah. And, and it's, it, the, the other parts of your body, when you realize that things are going on that are wrong, I didn't understand how much that is, how much it affects your brain. So basically, she's saying for the people online that she didn't realize how connected the brain is to the gut and how feelings and different things and the neurons that are there. Uh, uh, are, are transporting information back to the brain and how it affects so well. Can you catch? I'll try. Oh. All right, anybody else? Ooh, this yes. I didn't know about the growth hormone. Mm -hmm. I didn't know we needed it after we were 40. Yeah, growth hormone. We decrease in our growth hormone as we age. So I better hurry up to the next section. Mm -hmm. So looking at pain. Pain. We need to look a little bit about inflammation. So inflammation in the, in the brain and body, do you feel walking around like you're in a brain fog? Some people had raised their hand, they said, yeah, I feel like that sometimes. If you're sore, that's another issue if you have inflammation. And do you wake up in pain or are you bloated? These are all signs of inflammation. If you're bloated, that means you have inflammation going on in your body, in your gut area, right? And if you're walking around in a brain fog, that's part of it too. If you're sore all the time, that's another thing. Arthritis, I think of, right? So maybe um, there, there's some type of uh, inflammation going on. Did we go right? Okay. So what is inflammation? It's basically swelling, right? We think of swelling. But here's a very interesting fact that you must understand, that a joint can actually be swollen up to 30% and you don't even see it because it's inside the joint area. So if, if you have swelling inside the joint area up to 30%, you might feel a little stiffness, but you don't really notice it too much, but just a little bit, that you don't even notice it physically until it's over that percentage. So that's a really important fact here that we're doing everything that we possibly can, whether we're eating, drinking water, all those things, to flush out these impurities or whatever's causing that swelling. All right, so what can we do? Here's the thing that most people don't realize. We don't fix the brain before we fix the gut. Okay? We think that we're going to fix the brain, telling everybody, oh, you just, uh, all you got to do is claim God's word and um, it'll all be fixed. Well, you know what? Sometimes that does work. But God created us with a brain and he wants us to obey him. And God has said clearly in Genesis what we should be eating. So I like to look at not vegetarianism or... Uh, veganism, I look at the Eden diet, okay? The Eden diet, because that was really what God gave Adam and Eve. So if we look at that diet that God has given us, that's going to help us because what do we need? We need food because it gives us nutrients, and that nutrients, what does the nutrients do? It feeds the cells. And then if we have good circulation throughout the body, what is that doing? It means that the nutrition in the cells that was, that's been fed from the food is now going into every area of your body. 
It's feeding every cell, it's, it's getting everywhere. So our body is working properly. So we need to fix the gut first and then we'll fix the brain. So diet, foods that sabotage your brain would be foods that we need to stay away from that are huge when it comes to inflammation like arthritis and all those other things. Dairy is number one, sugar is number two, caffeine, alcohol, and refried, I'm sorry, refined grains or even grain-fed meats, grain-fed meats. <clears throat> and some bad fats are corn, soy, and canola oils. The only reason why they wouldn't be good is if it says it's non-GMO or it's organic. If it doesn't say that on there, don't buy them. Because these things are mass produced. Corn, soy, and canola are mass produced. So you always have to be aware of things that are heavily produced. So hydrogenated oils, that's like your peanut butters. You gotta get the natural peanut butter. Don't just buy any Jiffy or Skippy or whatever. Those are not good peanut butters, okay? They're cheap, they're very readily available, but they're not good. They're hydrogenated oils. And all oils used for frying, fried foods, because fried foods is probably the prime problem with it all. It's the prime culprit for triggering inflammation in the body. When I think of uh, you know, fried foods, I think of like high cholesterol problems as well. So things that damage our brain is our diet, our lifestyle, and overall health has everything to do with our brain health. And the biggest thing that I look for is actually blood sugar problems. People that have blood sugar imbalances that just kind of like whatever, that's a, that, to me, that's a, that's a sign to know that there's something going on with inflammation or they have a sign that's going on that this is not good with their gut or their, or, their, or their brain. Because when you have imbalances of your blood sugar level, that is not good. When I was here 32 years ago, when I was here living with the thrashes, um, I had a friend and we would meet here in the chapel early in the morning. Instead of eating, we fasted all day on Tuesdays. And my mother's a diabetic for many years, and um, you know that doesn't. You know I became vegetarian, vegan. You know, and so on Tuesdays I would fast for the whole day, and on Wednesday I would come off my fast by eating fruits, just eating fruits for breakfast. Well, I ate with the thrashes, right? So they knew what I was eating because I was eating right there. So on Wednesday, after about maybe about a year or so, maybe six months to a year of doing that, just that one day fast. I drank a lot of water, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't feel good. Two hours after I ate my breakfast, oh man, my head hurt like everything. So I was out going to, for my job, doing my job, and I'm like, I, oh, my head hurt so bad, I had to come back. So I came back and I went right to the Lifestyle Center, at that time it was just Anna Vody. I went there and I saw one of the girls that was, um, uh, she was a doctor in her country, but she wasn't a doctor in the United States. But she, she was like, I, I told her, I said, can you just take my blood sugar level? Just take it to see what's going on because there's something really bad here. She took it and it was like 29 or 28, something like that. It was so low. And she got, oh no. You know, she got really like, oh no, what's going on? And Wednesdays, we have medical conference. So that's what we had then. And so, yeah, what went on there was Dr. Kelvin, oh, she don't eat right. Because all I ate was fruit. All I ate was fruit because I was coming off a fast. But when you do that, you should not just eat fruit. You gotta have some protein or some grain with that. So when you're eating, it's just a small meal, right? You don't have to eat a lot because when you're coming off a fast, you don't wanna eat a lot. You just wanna eat a little bit. But this is the big thing. These, these, um, sh these blood sugar imbalances is huge. So blood sugar imbalances may lead to irritability, of course, lightheadedness, which I was getting. I was fatigued and I was having a, like a brain headache. Uh, you can also have mood fluctuations and memory loss. And so what's so interesting about the brain is simply this, that it can reroute and it can sprout. You see the pictures up here? We see that these three ways is how the brain can regenerate more cells. You know, when, back in the day, 30 some years ago, we used to think that the brain, whatever, how many cells we had for brain cells, that was it. But that is not true. Our brain continues to make more brain cells. Can you say hallelujah, thank you, Jesus? God had this all planned out, so then that way our body can work in such a way that it will able to keep us going, 
to live forever, so to speak, right? And if anything happened, he had another way of doing it. So this sprouting, the very first one, that long one there, that's the normal. And then we see a few other ones, that regeneration of how it works with the um, axon and the den dendrites extensions and how these connections are formed. I mean, this is so amazing. And I've got to stop because I think I'm over. But I'm going to try to finish this. I like to talk, so. Healing solutions. So no, there's four things that we can do in order to heal. First and foremost, it's called de-stress. We need to know how to de-stress. Get rid of stress. Number two is healthy plant-based diet. We need to make sure that we're fortifying our, our bodies with good food. The third thing is detoxification of our body and our brain. This is so vital because we need to make sure that um, the t everything is running smoothly in order to do that, that the bad cells are being picked up the, and the garbage sites are doing their thing and it's getting out of our system, the toxins. It has to be a good process in order to do that. And we need to do detoxification. But if you're eating some of these things, you are doing detoxification because there's foods out there that will help you like cucumber, lemons and limes and, you know, there's so many things, different types of lettuce and stuff. Natural medicines for your brain and your body, these are things we need to know. So these triggers are, are, are opportunities to know what we need to do in these four ways of lifestyle. So let's look at de-stress with, with a healthy lifestyle. You might even know some. The best one is putting scripture to memory. I'm a big believer in scripture, and I believe that God can do all things, that he can change. He can change us. He can heal us just like that. I believe it, and I've seen it, and I know. But then with that healing, we must do something else. Okay, another one would be uh, neurogenesis, which suggests that aerobic exercise, brain exercises, stress relief, and other lifestyle habits can encourage brain regeneration. Those three pictures of how the brain uh, regenerates those cells. Very good. So exercise. Make sure that you're getting your exercise to help those brain cells regenerate so then that way you're always having new cells coming in. So when those dead ones or those other ones that kind of had went through that life cycle, and it's time for them to go bye-bye, the new ones are there, and you, and you still keep on going. So what about a plant-based diet? Well, here's the things that we need to concentrate on. We need to look at B vitamins. When you think of the brain, just think of B vitamins. All the vitamins that are Bs, those are the ones you want to concentrate on. Omega-3 fatty acids and polyphenols are other things that you can look at. Things that you want to eat is basically fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, whole grains, nuts, olives, and avocados. Now this information should be in your handout. It's just that I separated some stuff a little further. I'm not for sure. So when it comes to detoxification of your brain and your body, we need to remove all sources of heavy metals exposure. That means our teeth. Look at our teeth. We have stuff in there that's not good. We need to get that out. Another thing is, what are we cooking with? Our food. You know, those things can leach into the food and it can cause problems as well. So we need to look at those kind of things. Aluminum. Um, detox your liver. That's the number one thing. If you're going to do a detox, the liver is number one thing. The second thing would be your, like your kidneys. Uh, your gut would be your last thing. But like kidneys, pancreas, and all of that, those things need to be detoxed. If you want to join our six-day wellness thing that we have every so often, or, uh, we do, I don't know how many per year, but... I talk about detoxification, and that's all I talk about. So that might be a good thing to kind of listen to. It's, it's very cheap to go through a six-day online. It's like, what, I don't know, $50 or something like that, and you have like 26 live Zoom calls with us on the medical field. So it's definitely well worth it, and, and you get really a lot of good information. So we want to make sure that we're detoxing and taking care of that lymphatic system so then that we're, we're, we're properly... Um, functioning and excreting any toxins out of our system, especially heavy metals too. The other thing is supplements, B vitamins, folate, which is B3, I believe, and B6. Those are two biggies. But folate is actually in green leafy vegetables, uh, sulfur-containing foods like broccoli, kale, radish, onion, garlic. These are also really good things because what it does is it opens up those pathways to get those toxins out. Uh, essential minerals. Uh, for your tissues, things like um, calcium, zinc, magnesium, these are really key um, minerals that we need in order to keep functioning properly. And also the heavy metals to get them out of our system. 
<clears throat> natural medicine for our brain would be multivitamin. If you know that you're not eating enough of a variety of foods per week, uh, you're eating the same thing over and over all the time, that's not a good thing. You need to have just a little bit more variety. You can't be eating, I mean, I look at what I eat and I'm like, my oats is my oatmeal for breakfast. Next day I have oat waffles, you know. You know, too much oat, and then I have granola. It's all oats. You gotta shift it, you gotta change it about. Otherwise you're getting the same kind of vitamins and minerals every day when you need to have other things also included. Um, when it comes, and also probiotics is good as well. Algae based um, omega-3 fatty acid. And for herbs, Bacopa, B-A-C-O-P-A, -A, is the number one herb for your brain. Most people think of Gucci Cola and um, ginkgo bibiloba. Ginkgo bibiloba is the one that most people think of, but really what you need is gutta cola and ginkgo together. And the reason why is the gutta cola opens up your blood vessels, so then that way when the ginkgo comes in, it can get into where it needs to go. Same thing, bacoba, uh, lutein, uh, foods such as walnuts, flax seeds, linseeds, turmeric, whole grains and broccoli, all very, very good when it comes to natural medicines for our brain and our body. Ashwagandha is another one. People think of, oh, you know, that'll help me with my moods. It also helps with anxiety and depression. It also helps us to lose weight because there's certain chemicals called uh, liptin, grenoline, and uh, cortisol. Those are all linked with um, trying to lose weight as well. We also have this seed extract called a 5-HTP which is very important as well. You can buy that in a bottle, you know, in uh, capsules. Passion flower, uh, rudial, rudolia, ginger, turmeric, and burbine, burbine. If someone has like really bad blood sugar levels and they're diabetic, I usually tell them to take burbine, berberine, berberine. And that would be 500 milligrams three times a day, plus changing their diet. Calcium is very important because it has to do with nerve impulses and transmitting. Copper is another thing that's really good because it helps with the iron metabolism and your nerves. And then um, we have humeric and uh, fulvic acid powder, which is very good when it comes to getting rid of heavy metals in your body to get that out. Iron and magnesium are good for your nerve function. If you have a lot of spasm, you definitely want to make sure you get your magnesium. And potassium helps with the nervous transmission, your nerve transmission, as well as zinc. Those are very, very important. And I did get it done. So what would you do to implement any of this information that you learned today? What can you do after listening to about your brain, your gut, and some pain with inflammation? What can you do that you can start implementing that maybe you haven't started? Maybe key things that you might want to start taking every so often just to kind of help with your brain. Maybe there's some foods that you might want to make sure that your, your, your meal plan is the way it needs to be so you can continue and um, stay healthy in the sense of shifting a little bit in that direction. So what you need to do is write down what you're going to do for your plan when you go home because you're getting fed really good here. You're getting your opportunity to go walking. Not only are you being mentally fed, but you're also being physically fed. And then you're getting your exercise in as well. Spiritual. And spiritually fed. Yes, that's what, that's what I mean in the, in the mind. But anyway, yes, absolutely. So um, it is 1 o'clock, and I'm going to end with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much. You have created us fearfully and wonderfully made. That's who we are. Because we were downloaded with your information that you wanted us to have. So Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for being such an awesome God and designing us in such a special way. We want to take care of our brains. We want to take care of our bodies. We want to take care of our gut. And so, Father, with this information, I pray that people are able to take information that was shared today, that they can start implementing and shifting certain little things around in order to get those certain foods in, to get those certain um, other things in, whether it be herbs or something that they might need. So, Father, I want to thank you and praise you. And for every person that's here, I pray that you will bless them with mental health. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.